Hello, and welcome back to the Shadow Work Library. I'm Jessica DePazzi, and for the next at least 49 shows, I'm going to take you through this series that covers the spectrum of negative patterns in the human experience. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year. I hope you enjoyed my episode with Richard Millette, which came out the last week of December, where he talked about the energies that we can prepare for in the next year. So friendly reminder on that, we have a notable astrological event happening on January 26th, 2021, which may be bringing us an extra boost of love and compassion and spirituality in relation to the karmic journey of everybody here on earth. If we're in our gift states, that is, that's what the nodes of the moon represent, karmic themes. But if we're swimming in the shadows that day, we need to watch out for escapism and addictive behaviors. And so just like it was planned, which it wasn't, on this episode, I'm going to be talking about karma because it's one of these interesting theories that comes with common misconceptions and actually might have more to do with our everyday lives than we realize. So that was pretty cool that we were able to touch on that a little bit with Richard, but today specifically, we're going to go through it in much more depth. But on this episode, actually, I'm really going to be talking about the shadow of dishonor and how it transforms into the gift of graciousness. Now, before I get into that, I'm going to be co-hosting the Goals with Soul workshop this Wednesday, January 6th at 5 p.m. Pacific with Dr. Danielle McGinnis and Jennifer McMaster, you've heard on the show before. This workshop is going to be an interactive Zoom call where we're going to be walking you through a very unique way of setting super clear and concise soul-aligned intentions for the new year and beyond the new year, hopefully. And then we get into blocks and shadows that prevent you from making these things a reality. It's going to be really fun, super casual. We made it really affordable as well, so anyone can join. It's only 15 bucks US. And if you go to the workshop live, there's also a special gift for you at the end. This is particularly made for women, but anybody who's called to join definitely can. And if you can't make it at that time, we'll be sending out a replay and the worksheets to you so you can go through it on your own time. So to save your seat for the Goals for Soul workshop, you can visit mygraceandgrit.com slash goals with soul and goals with soul is one word. And yeah, I'll put that link into the show notes. If you're interested, well, I will see you on Wednesday evening. Okay, let's get into today's show. Dishonor. What is it? So whenever you project negative emotions at another person, either internally or externally, you're dishonoring both yourself and the other person. For example, if you're feeling negative or dissonant and you're blaming the feeling on somebody else's actions undeservingly, whether it's out loud, which is the reactive response, or you're quietly stewing in it, which is the repressive response, you're experiencing the shadow of dishonor. Now, if you're looking for more information on projection, the Grace and Grit team, those women that I had mentioned, we did a webinar where Jen and Dr. D explained psychological projection in more detail. And you can watch that replay on the mygraceandgrit.com website. It's totally free. You don't need to input your email or anything like that. And you can find that that definition somewhere near the halfway point of the video. It's pretty good. And because we already talked about it, I don't want to spend too much time on it here. But dishonor doesn't just stop at projection. Another form of dishonor is an attempt to subdue your own feelings and distrusting your feelings. Every mood you have is put there directly for you to trust in it, which by the way is not the same thing as acting it out. In that same webinar I was just talking about, you can also learn these six stages of transformation. And so the reason why so many people do not get through the transformational process and they get stuck in dissonance and that dissonance feedback loop is because they perhaps don't have the courage to complete the internal process beyond blame and shame. Trusting in your feelings is an internal process that takes quite a bit of courage because negative emotions are a natural part of the world. And if they can be used to be useful and transformed, they can become art, creativity, or service. And their power is really awesome at that point. But it's just a matter of how much you take responsibility for your own feelings. The shadow of dishonor also has you trying to change or fix your moods rather than allowing them to simply pass through your system naturally. It also has us trying to fix the moods and the emotions of other people that we love rather than, you know, allowing them to experience their own constructive suffering without enabling them to feel 
feel better quickly. But here's a truth that I took directly from the Gene Keys, and I really do believe it to be a capital T truth, and I don't say that lightly. You cannot reach higher states of consciousness without first passing through your own suffering. I'll say that again. You cannot reach higher states of consciousness and transform without first passing through your own suffering. And this is where karma comes into play. Now, karma, interestingly enough, has often been misrepresented as retribution or revenge from God for doing something bad, or like Santa who creates a naughty and nice list. There are endless internet memes about karma out there that are just straight up low vibrational. You know what I mean? Using the theory of karma as some kind of revenge mechanism. But karma isn't punishment, really, even though it can feel that way. It can't be because we don't learn through punishment and retribution. So evolutionarily, that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But we do learn through the fulfillment and joy and gratitude that happens when we can go through that challenging process of transformation to its natural end. And if you don't just trust your feelings and claim extreme ownership over your own emotional states, that's how you get stuck in the dissonance feedback loop that feels like this endless struggle, these endless patterns of suffering. I'd actually like to get into this a little deeper now. So there have been many systems created over the years devoted to helping us understand spirituality. And really quick, a definition of spirituality that I like is that it's the quality of being concerned with the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. That was actually the first thing on Google that popped up when I looked to define it, but it worked well. As we honor many of these different teachings and systems that come from all over the globe and integrate a Western scientific thinking, you get a modern new age spirituality or mysticism. And if you're not so into new age spirituality, because I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but you're still seeking to study theology that encompasses a lot of different religions, you might want to check out the Baha'i religion. I was introduced to this by my friend Shane Hines when I was, uh, Jeff and I were invited to the Onnit retreat in Sedona. He's a devoted Baha'i bloke. <laughs> I don't know if you call them members, but he's a Baha'i believer and, and practices it. And it's a beautiful religion that makes a lot of sense right now. And they also have a practice of not converting people. So they believe, I understand that they believe that you get the message when you get it to become Baha'i, which is why I'd imagine that it's not as well known as others at the moment. Anyway, new age spirituality and mysticism is really exciting and I think it's very beautiful, but I also think it's a bit confusing as we make sense of so many different traditions in our modern context. One insight of mysticism that has been really meaningful to me, but also confusing, which is why this episode took so long to put together, is the human aura and the different layers that make it up. Now, I could have just gone on any website and looked up the layers of an aura and just put them out here, but I really wanted to understand them as as well as I could within reason to be able to explain this to you. And I think that I've done that. So hang in there with me. Now, there are a few different thoughts on how many layers there are, but Richard Rudd states that there are seven main layers of the human aura and he calls them the Corpus Christi. Other people also call them the Corpus Christi, but that's how he knows them. And As I know it, he's also a Christian mystic, so I might be wrong on that one, but that combination makes for a very interesting methodology that I personally really dig. And I'm going to explain some of these layers so that we can get a more complete understanding of how karmic transformation works. Going from the closest layer to the most expansive, there's physical, astral, mental, causal, buddhic, atmic, and monadic monadic. (laughs) And the reason why this is important to know is that each layer or subtle body, as they're also known, builds upon the next. And it's believed that in reincarnation, the higher subtle bodies, the causal, buddhic, atmic, and the monadic layers, they survive incarnation. Oh yeah. You have to buy in for a moment that reincarnation of your soul is a truth. Okay. I swear this will make sense once I get through the definitions of these subtle bodies. So here we go. The closest layer in our aura is the physical body, which includes our DNA, which I talk about a lot on the show. And so this is the foundation upon which everything else is built upon, which is just one other 
of the million reasons why taking care of your body is really important. The next layer is the astral body, and sometimes it's called the emotional body. And this is the layer that collects your emotions along all spectrums of high and low vibes. This is where we store our emotional pain and our pleasure and our emotional impulses. And it's said that the astral body is the most active during actually sleep when it processes your daily emotions in your dream life. So from a biological perspective, I think this is what would be considered theta brainwave states. So when you're dreaming or you're about to fall asleep or you're just waking up or you're daydreaming during the day, all of these emotions in your subconscious are stored in your astral body and they're happening with theta brainwaves, I believe. Pretty sure about that one. (laughs) The next layer after is your mental body and is constructed from your thinking life. This is also influenced by all the thinking that goes on around you. So your mental body and your aura stores all of your thoughts and your mental desires along, again, all those spectrums of high and low vibes. Now, the fourth layer called the causal body is also known as the soul. And I'm actually going to read these next layers right out of the gene keys so there isn't anything lost in my translation. The causal body directly corresponds to the physical body, but at a higher level. It stores the collective goodwill of the human soul as a memory signature written in light. This finely tuned vehicle forms a structure hub for all the high frequency thoughts, words, and deeds that we have initiated during our many journeys in incarnation. After death, the lower three bodies disintegrate and only that which is refined and pure is drawn up and retained in the causal body. The causal body responds to higher visions and archetypes that lie beyond language, but can still be conveyed through trans direct transmission to the three lower planes. As your causal body develops more lucidity, the higher bodies can use it as a means of directing higher and higher frequencies to the lower three bodies. In this respect, the causal body is the bridge between the lower and the higher planes. The fifth layer is the buddhic body. The buddhic body is the higher octave of the astral body. Remember the one that has, it's about the emotions. As such, it reveals the pure truth that humanity and all the earth planes are in fact one single organism. Once your awareness is fully anchored in the buddhic body, the causal body dissolves and reincarnation in the normal sense is no longer necessary. It's through the buddhic body that human beings have access to the field of universal love and the higher ecstasies associated with enlightenment. It represents the third feminine realm of the Holy Trinity, that of divine activity. So if you've ever sat with daime or ayahuasca, you may have experienced what it's like to experience the buddhic body. That was just my addition there. He didn't say that. The sixth layer is the atmic body. As the higher octave to the mental body, the atmic body allows human beings access to the higher evolutions outside the process of physical incarnation. Whilst the buddhic body retains its connection to humanity through its compassion, the atmic body brings awareness into the cosmic field of Christ consciousness, directly merging your awareness with divine mind and heart, the second aspect of the Holy Trinity. It is through this atmic body that the great avatar streams enter the world. It is also the realm of the cities, the many miraculous manifestations of the divine. Now, the cities, this is interesting. This is not something that I talk about on this show yet, but I will get to that. The final layer is the monadic body. Hardly a body in our normal sense of the word, the monad, is the unbridled primal essence of the divine consciousness itself. It enters the world of form through the causal body, which is the veil it takes on in order to enter the lower world and corresponds with the first aspect of the Holy Trinity, which is divine will. The monadic body is present within every single atom on all planes, right down to the physical plane. However, until awareness has risen to the atmic body, the monadic cannot be fully expressed. When it does express, it condenses the atmic body and all the others along with it, revealing true divine essence as consciousness beyond understanding. At this stage, each of the lower three bodies, physical, astral, and mental, are absorbed into their high-frequency counterparts, the causal, the buddhic, and the atmic thus revealing the true mystical nature of the Trinity as three in one. Okay, so again, it's believed that in reincarnation, the higher subtle bodies, the the causal, buddhic, and atmic, and monadic layers, these all survive incarnation, and they're actually aspects of what's known as the Akashic Ocean, which I'll get into more in a second. And so if we can subscribe to this, we can begin to understand one of the great keys to all human suffering, which is 
the inability to accept responsibility for our own thoughts, feelings, and actions on our own physical bodies. Okay, so Akasha or the Akashic Ocean, this is something that I'm sure many of you know about or have at least heard before. In the Akasha, it's believed that every thought, idea, and action from the past, present, and the future is all stored there. And if you're familiar with string theory or if you've heard about it, the Akashic records are like a database of what's happening in all the universe that's coexisting together. Now, to understand the Akashic records in a historical context, there are many ideas that we could incorporate or should incorporate. There's Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, and Tibetan definitions of Akasha, and then there are the Western views of ether, space, and the quantum field. So yeah, we can look at the Bible's reference to recording human activity, particularly in the Book of Life and the Alaya Vishyana, or the storehouse memory of Buddhism and Tibetan belief systems. But then there's also this presence of divine recorder or scribe known by various names across many other religions and esoteric belief systems. So it's this concept is coming from all different kinds of areas. But if we use the mystic term Akashic Records, we're talking basically about a record of what will happen, is happening, and has already happened. And because the Akasha exists in that higher dimension, the rules of time don't really apply to it. So to the Akashic Records, time is a flat circle. And so information from 2,000 years ago is as accessible to us as what happened to us yesterday. And what happened to you yesterday is as available as what could happen to you if you stay on the same destiny trajectory in 10 years. So what does this mean for the shadow of dishonor? Well, to understand the shadow of dishonor, we need to subscribe to the idea that consciousness exists in these many dimensions and it responds to thoughts, acts, feelings, words, and even intentions. It's a vast quantum field that acts like a great memory bank, holding and recording every impression that's ever made. And the reason why dishonor really exists and is hiding under this facade of just plain suffering is because we don't really believe that all of the things that go on in our own heads have negative consequences other than maybe adrenal fatigue and being stressed out all the time. But it's important to remind ourselves here again that negative emotions in and of themselves are a very natural part of being human. It's really a matter of how much responsibility you can take for your own feelings without trying to fix or change them before that transformational process is over. And that's one of the purposes of the Akashic field and instant karma They invite you to receive your own slice of suffering. And if you don't take responsibility for your own thoughts, words, and actions and intentions, the Akashic field simply sends the same forces back towards you again and again and again until you finish that cycle. So what do we do about all of this? The shadow of dishonor transforms into the gift of grace when you can learn to temper your own emotions and release them safely without disrespecting others or yourself. This gift is super beautiful. It's the ability to live life to the fullest without suppressing your feelings, but while also having a deep respect for the feelings of others. And so it's this delicate balance between service and self-love, which means if you're stepping into this as one of your primary gifts, others will naturally look to you for guidance and authority because of that balance. Acting with grace and consideration in everything you do, though, is no simple feat. It takes a practice of remembering that we're all being listened to and knowing that if you dishonor someone through emotional or psychological projection, either reactively or repressively, the lessons will come back to you. And to cultivate a practice of living in grace, that's going to take more than a simple practice like the ones I usually end the show with. This requires a path of transformation, understanding your core wounding patterns, which I did that episode on. I don't remember which episode, one of the earlier ones. It also requires gaining the ability to name and receive your emotions, with, which is what Dr. Danielle specializes in, and learning your safety mechanisms and demoting your inner critic and promoting your corner man. It's kind of like this identity apocalypse of sorts. And if you're interested in doing this work for real, that's why we created Grace and Grit for Women and The Trials for Men. And by the way, The Trials website 
SSL security certificate or whatever it's called. It's just, it expired. That's why it has a warning on our website that we'll steal your money. <laughs> I promise that's not what we do. I'm just waiting for my IT friend to help me with it. Um, but and the reason why we broke it up into a men's course and a women's course is because the masculine and the feminine operate through emotions, patterns, and chaos very differently. And so these programs were designed specifically around those preferences. We do have a few women who are in the trials because they, the masculine form of transformation really spoke more to them. And that's all totally good to go. Everyone's preferences are unique to them. But the basis of the courses are to find the essence of who you are. So you know where you end and others begin. And so you can take ownership of how your life transpires by moving beyond blocks and recurring themes. And it all starts and ends with grace because I'll go back to Richard Rudd. Above all else, this is the gift of living life from a place of deep love and soul. It all has to do with grace. So that is the shadow of dishonor, which transforms into the gift of graciousness. I wish I was able to wrap that up a little bit more simply, but the fact of the matter is it takes quite a lot of little micro adjustments in order to get through that transformational process. And it takes a bit longer, but that's specifically why we created those programs. I'm going to have all the resources that I mentioned in the show notes here. So where you can register for the Goals with Soul workshop that's happening on January 6th, 2021. I'll also post where you can replay the webinar that has more information on emotions, transformation and projection. That's just on our website. And then where you can sign up for the trials or Grace and Grit. Now, Grace and Grit for Women starts on February 1st, so you'll have until then to hop on a call with me or one of the other ladies to find out if this is a good fit for you. And also, if you come to the webinar on Wednesday, there's something that we'll be gifting you that you won't want to miss out on if you are interested in Grace and Grit. So on the next Shadow Work Library submission, I'm going to be covering the shadow of agitation, which transforms into the gift of initiative. So if you're feeling a lot of fear and are unable to pull yourself out or you're feeling hostility or you have the tendency to provoke hostility in others, this is going to be a really great episode for you. And as always, if you have any questions about what I talked about today, you can email me at jessica at the special forces experience.com or you can hit me up on Instagram at jessica depotzi underscore. That's D-E-P-A-T-I-E. Have a great week, everybody. Stay safe, but not too safe. And we will talk again soon.